this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator. <laughs> I've got a pen and I've got a phone. Uh, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. My change in party will enable me to be re-elected. I actually did vote for the $87 billion dollars before I voted against it. Mr. Reagan will raise taxes, and so will I. It is the constitutional position. It is the advice of the founders to follow a non-interventionist foreign policy. Stay out of entangling alliances. Welcome to episode 5 of Liberty or Death Radio. In last episode, episode 4, we covered police brutality around the country, which is an epidemic these days. We're also going to cover in episode 5 here some of the underlying reasons for this abuse. You can find us online at DanielRayRichardson.com. Again, that's DanielRayRichardson.com. Also on Twitter at Liberty or Death R, Twitter.com forward slash Liberty or Death R. Facebook.com forward slash Liberty or Death Radio. Contact us at Liberty or Death Radio at gmail.com. We're going to look this evening at the underlying reasons for police militarization. We look at these as, first of all, military veterans who are coming back from the wars overseas and coming back and filling the position of a police officer. And we see the dangers with this, including the possibility of undiagnosed or untreated PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. And I see that as a disaster waiting to happen. We also see military equipment being placed in peace officers' hands. Weapons of war on our streets, as President Obama recently said, we do not want this. See the war on drugs, the war on terror. Radley Balco, a libertarian blogger, writes for LouRockwell.com and the Huffington Post, said the founders evinced a clear wariness of standing armies born of experience and a study of history, and they designed the Constitution expressly to guard against the home raids property seizures, and other routine indignities to which the British subjected its colonists. If even the earlier attempts at centralized police forces would have alarmed the founders, today's policing would have terrified them. According to Hillsdale College's in Premise magazine, two years ago a video surfaced of a training lecture on regulatory enforcement by the head of the EPA's Region 6 office, which oversees Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. The senior administrator who was appointed by President Obama in 2009 cited the Roman Empire as an inspiration for his mode of operation. He said, quote, Romans used to conquer little villages in the Mediterranean. They'd go into a little Turkish town somewhere, find the first five guys they saw, and crucify them. And then you know that town was really easy to manage for the next few years. This is the attitude that we have from even the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, not even supposed to be really be a law enforcement so to speak, as far as what we consider law enforcement. But yes, this is the attitude we get from police and and law enforcement these days. Graham versus Connor was a very popular and uh, important Supreme Court decision from years ago. It established a three-pronged test to evaluate the reasonableness of an officer's actions. These are, what is the nature of the offense? What brought the officer and the suspect together? Number two, is the person an immediate threat to the officer or another person? And number three is the person trying to flee or evade arrest. Of these three, other court's decisions have repeatedly stressed that the immediate threat is the most critical in establishing if the force used was reasonable. To oversimplify Graham versus Connor, you are not reasonable if you use a baton, pepper spray, taser, in dart mode, or personal weapon strikes on a person who is not an immediate threat to you or someone else. You are allowed to use those tools if you can explain how that suspect 
was a threat. So those are some rules of engagement that we see Supreme Court precedent and other cases that have basically set these three tests for what is allowed as far as striking a suspect, as far as engaging them with some of these weapons that police officers do carry. Recently, prominent celebrities and leaders of the Congressional Black Caucus endorsed a major nationalization of local police forces, reports the New American by the John Birch Society, calling for creation of a federal police czar and greater federal controls over law enforcement in the wake of the Ferguson, Missouri shootings and protests. The administration must appoint a federal czar, the letter states, housed in the U.S. Department of Justice, who is specifically tasked with promoting the professionalization of local law enforcement, monitoring egregious law enforcement activities, and adjudicating suspicious actions of local law enforcement agencies that receive federal funding. Note those words, that receive federal funding. We'll be talking more about that as the show goes on. This letter is signed by Congressional Black Caucus Chairman Marcia Fudge and her fellow members Elijah Cummings, Stephen Horsford, John Lewis, Gwen Moore, and Barbara Lee. Also signing on to the letters are the leaders of the ACLU, several labor unions, AFL-CIO and SEIU, and actress Cynthia Nixon. Ironically, the letter makes the valid point that the militarization of police departments across the country is creating conditions that will further erode the trust that should exist between residents and the police who serve them. The proliferation of machine guns, silencers, armored vehicles and aircraft, and camouflage in local law enforcement units does not bode well for police-community relations, the future of our cities, or our country. End of quote. The source of this militarization is not endemic racism, however. It has been federal intervention and aid through the Department of Defense's Law Enforcement Support Office, or LESO, under the auspices of fighting the drug war and terrorism. LESO notes on its website that since its inception in 1991, the 1033 program, which we will discuss more later, has transferred more than $5.1 billion worth of property. In other words, the same federal government that is responsible for militarizing the police to the tune of $449 million per year is what Representative Marcia Fudge and her colleagues suggest should be reviewing and controlling local police. Kind of scary, isn't it? Police departments should not be solely responsible for investigating them themselves, the letter states. DOJ must set and implement national standards of investigation that are democratic, involving independent review boards broadly representative of the community served, transparent, and enforceable. Pretty interesting stuff there. In 1997, Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act, which they do pass every year. It also included the 1033 program. The 1033 program allows law enforcement support office to transfer excess Department of Defense property to law enforcement agencies across the United States and its territories. The LESO, or Law Enforcement Support Office, serves as a bridge between the U.S. military and local law enforcement agencies and is overseen by the Pentagon. The 1033 program started with the war on drugs, and Congress decided that if law enforcement personnel were waging a drug war, they needed to be outfitted like warriors. The LESO slogan is, transferring property from the warfighter to the crime fighter. Another one says, get with the program. So, as we said, Congress passed this NDAA in, in 1997, included the 1033 program. So it's, it's allowing all this military equipment, this military surplus equipment, to be transferred to local law enforcement agencies all across our country. There are over 600 mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles all across the United States. A few of those states are Texas has 68, Ohio has 36, Oklahoma with coming up with 28, Louisiana with 19, Washington with 17, Georgia has 12, New York 9, Pennsylvania has 7, Nevada has 5. In Pine County, Minnesota, a population of 29,218, they acquired an MRAP in 2013 to use for search and rescue operations in the Pine County swampy areas. It has since been used for a zombie apocalypse training event. Well, big whoop. So they got a multi-thousand dollar vehicle just so they can have a zombie apocalypse training event? Seriously? Ohio State University police got one in order to provide presence on football game days. Bloomingdale, Georgia, population 2,713, received four grenade launchers. Grenade launchers? Through the 1033 program. Their police chief says it's his way to send a message that officers are armed to meet any threat. But admits in the 20 years he served Bloomingdale, the police force has never had to use deadly force against anybody. In Keene, New Hampshire, 23,000 population, they justified their acquisition of an armored tactical vehicle as integral to the town's safety, saying they needed it to patrol the annual pumpkin festival and other dangerous situations. 
And the, the story goes on and on and on, such as Morvan, Georgia, where they have a population of 532, and they've grabbed $4 million worth of surplus, including three boats, scuba gear, rescue rafts, and so forth, and the town's deepest body of water is an ankle-deep creek. So you can see the waste. You can see the buildup, the, the bulking up of the armament of local police forces. In the war on terror, the entire nation has received over $34 billion in federal grants to help local police forces combat terrorist activities. And this story goes on and on and on. We will be discussing this more. Let's take some calls now on Liberty or Death Radio. Call us at 888-LIVE-FREE. That's 888-LIVE-FREE. Okay, Frank from Detroit, you're on Liberty or Death Radio. Welcome. What is your comment? Hi, Dan. I'm a, I'm a big fan. Hang on, let me turn down my radio. I'm sorry. Sure, yeah, get that interference out of here, Frank, please. Thank you. Dan, I'm a big fan of the show. Always glad to have new new fans, Frank. Appreciate you joining us. What's your comment, sir? I think you're a little off base here tonight. Yeah, how's, how's that, Frank? Well, you know, with this commander-in-chief in office, um, I, we, need a, we need a strong defense. Our local communities need a strong police force. You know, I, 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 I read the news, I watch a lot of news, and... Uh, if, if it's only the military and the police stand between us and and the radicals. Yeah, I hear you, Frank. I really, I, I hear you, and and certainly there's a criminal element out there, and certainly with the uh, talk about ISIS and so forth overseas, we understand there's a need for a strong defense. Obviously, what we're talking about though is this being directed at the local communities, and I just wanted to just share a few facts with you about President Obama and the ways he's accelerated police militarization. Now, this is the Huffington Post uh, reporting on this, so this isn't just something that I pulled out of thin air or out of my own head, or Fox News, of course. You know, we all know how they are. So, just want to share these these facts with you. Number one is Pentagon giveaway. So, in the uh, October 2011 newsletter, uh, with the motto, From Warfighter to Crime Fighter, the agency that oversees the Pentagon giveaways boasted that fiscal year 2011 was the most productive in the program's history, meaning that they had given away more uh, surplus military equipment than ever before. Also, the burn grants that ni- Congress created in 1988, these have increased over the years, and they've also created multi-jurisdictional anti-drug and anti-gang forces all over the country. And I'm sure as a good liberal, Frank, you don't support uh, drug laws that, that send people to jail for simple possession of marijuana. So, so let, let, me, well, let me ask you, what, what is the appropriate size of the military in your in your uh esteemed opinion, sir. Okay, well, I think we've got to be very careful that we're distinguishing the military from the police, first of all. Uh, we've got, we got basically, we've got military surplus equipment that's going into the hands of these local police, and, you know, I'm asking, first of all, you know, what are they doing with military equipment on the streets of our cities? Oh, Mr. Obama said, you know, we want to keep weapons of war off of our streets, and here, this is exactly what he is promoting, what he is supporting, by sending grenade launchers, uh, MRAS, mine resistant ambush protection vehicles, by sending machine guns, well, by sending, I you mean, know. I, I, I think you need to read the Constitution. The president is sworn to protect the homeland. That's in there. Oh, you ever, read the, you ever read the Constitution? Yeah, yes, I do, Frank. But you know what? I don't think that my next door neighbor or the guy that bags my groceries at Pathmark uh, is really looking to just blow up. You know, a building. I really don't believe that. So, I mean, hopefully your neighbors, you know, they're they're of the same ilk. Hopefully that... So you hung up. Okay, that's awesome. Oh, there goes Frank. Good riddance. Good night, Frank. In case you just joined us, you're listening to Liberty or Death Radio with Daniel Richardson online at DanielRayRichardson.com. The Ron Paul Institute reports that a recently on June 19th, a roll call of 355 no votes to 62 yes votes voted down an amendment offered by Representative Alan Grayson to the Department of Defense Appropriations Act that would have curtailed the transfer of U.S. military equipment to local police. Grayson explained on the House floor that he offered his amendment to address, quote, a growing problem throughout our country, which is the militarization of local law enforcement agencies. Grayson mentions documents that the transfers involved a long list of military weapons and equipment, including, since 2006 alone, 432 mine-resistant ambush-protected armored vehicles, MRAPs, 435 other armored vehicles, 533 planes, 92,763 machine guns. Grayson makes the point that as the law stands, there's virtually no limit on what weapons and equipment may be transferred. In Bell County in Texas, we see the District Attorney Henry Garza announced he will seek the death penalty against the man accused of killing a Colleen police officer during a shooting.